Good uh, morning, everyone. Good morning, representative of states, representatives of uh, civil society. My name is Roberta Clark, and I'm chair of the commission. And I want to welcome everyone to our 22nd hearing, hearing number 22, in this 191st uh, period of sessions. The title of this hearing is Situation of Haitians in Human Mobility in Jamaica. It's a session that will last 90 minutes. And it was requested by an organization with the very poetic title of Freedom Imaginaries. And we have representatives of civil society here with us, and we also have representatives of the state. Welcome, um, and happy to have you here. How are we going to organize our time? Civil society will have 20 minutes to make your presentation. The state has 20 minutes as well. The commission has up to 20 minutes to ask questions or make comments, and maybe we won't use all of those 20 minutes, and then we go back to civil society for 12 minutes for you and 12 minutes for the state. The objective of this hearing is to provide the commission with up-to-date information about the situation of Haitians in mobility in Jamaica uh, with a focus on Haitian asyl asylum seekers deprived of liberty in conditions which have been, which has been characterized as inhumane and Haitian children in state facilities separated from their parents. The hearing also seeks to call on the state to work with the Caribbean community, according to their background, to establish a rights-based regional framework for the protection of Haitians in mobility. I want to just stay with me here at the table. To my furthest right is Commissioner Arif Bulkan, who is the country rapporteur for Jamaica. And next to him is Executive Secretary Tanya Renon, and to my left, um, C Commissioner Andre Pochak, who also is the rapporteur for the rights of people in human mobility. Uh, and so with that, I open the session and invite civil society representatives of Freedom Imaginaries to make their presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good morning, Commissioners, State Representatives, members of civil society. I am Melania Lane, founder and international human rights lawyer of Freedom Imaginaries. I am joined by Gabrielle Apollon in person, and she will introduce herself. And on Zoom, we have Merita Desulme. Uh, the president of the Haiti Jamaica Society, and Marcus Goff, attorney at law at Goff Law. We are honored to participate in this hearing on the situation of Haitians in human mobility in Jamaica, and the urgency of this hearing cannot be overstated. Amid the devastating crisis in Haiti, there has been an increase in flows of vulnerable Haitian migrants and asylum seekers to Jamaica. In response, Jamaica has initiated an escalating cycle of migration-related torture and abuse involving practices such as criminalization, arbitrary detentions in deplorable conditions, family separations, and collective expulsions without due process or an individualized assessment of protection needs, which is to say, an ass assessment of their risk of persecution upon return to Haiti. The situation of Haitian children and families is particularly devastating with Haitian parents and breastfeeding mothers being detained and separated from their young children or expelled from Jamaica with children left behind. But much of what is happening is still below the radar beyond international scrutiny. There is no publicly available data or information on asylum seekers and migrants in Jamaica and their, com their protection needs or the extent to which Jamaica's emerging policies and practices are impacting human rights. And it is in this context that the objective of this hearing is to provide testimony and to share our findings on what is, in effect, Jamaica's zero tolerance policy towards Haitian asylum seekers and migrants. We will end with recommendations for a rights-based regional framework and mechanism for the protection of Haitians in mobility. But before we start, we want to situate the discussion and we invite Gabriel Apollon to provide a brief overview of the context of Haitians in mobility in the region. Thank you very much, Melanie. And good morning. I direct the Haitian Immigrant Rights Project at NYU School of Law's Global Justice Clinic. Um, I coordinate a coalition of Haitian migrant rights leaders called the Hemispheric Network for Haitian Migrants' Rights. And we have members based in 14 countries throughout the hemisphere. Our network members are based in source, transit, and destination countries for Haitian migrants, including Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, bah Bahamas, and Barbados. And as, as uh, Melanie mentioned, Melanie is going to speak today and, and, and a number of our colleagues about the conditions that Haitian migrants are facing in Jamaica. But prior to that, we wanted to contextualize the situation with what's occurring in the region more broadly. And in Haiti, over the past several years, the violence and insecurity wrought by armed groups has terrorized Haiti's population and di displaced them both internally and across borders. 
Currently, over 700,000 people have been internally displaced due to the violence. And as we speak, there's a suspension of flights from the U.S. to Haiti for 30 days due to the fact that numerous planes were shot at in the international airport in Port-au-Prince earlier this week. And as legal pathways and protections available to Haitians have remained minimal in the face of rising violence in Haiti, Haitian people have sought safety and fled by any means necessary to wherever they can, which has meant new migratory routes and destination countries that have developed, both in the Caribbean and throughout South America. Haitian migration has become a hemisphere-wide phenomenon. But instead of being recognized as vulnerable citizens fleeing their country and attempting to seek refuge, Haitian nationals are often summarily expelled or deported. And any country that is forcibly returning Haitians at this time is doing so in the face of UNHCR's non-return advisory, which has been in place for two years and states that there should be no forced returns to Haiti um, due to the conditions there. And yet, these deportations continue from Jamaica, from the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, the U.S., and the Dominican Republic. And yes, last year alone, the, De the Dominican Republic deported over 250,000 people to Haiti. And not only are these deportations continuing, likely in violation of states' non refoulement obligations, but there is blatant disregard by many states in the region for a myriad of rights that Haitians and mobility have, rights that are enshrined in international law, the right to seek asylum, the right of non-discrimination, the prohibition against arbitrary detention, to name a few. And we do think it's important to highlight what's currently happening in the Dominican Republic um, in this context, um, particularly because of the dangerous precedent that it can set for other countries in the region. Um, collective expulsions are prohibited under international law, and yet the Dominican Republic has unabashedly claimed mass deportations as its official policy. And on October 2nd of this year, the government has announced a mass deportation campaign with the aim of deporting up to 10,000 people per week. We know this is not a hearing on the Dominican Republic, but we do recognize that there is this precedent that could be incredibly dangerous, not just for um, Jamaica as we speak uh, about today, but in the region. Um, and for the past six weeks, the members of our network and the DR have witnessed firsthand the terror, violence, and persecution that is being experienced on a daily basis. Our network members in Haiti are witnessing the conditions that people are being returned in, as a number of our organizations are some of the first points of contact that thousands of, for thousands of people who are deported. And what we are hearing and seeing is that in addition to being a campaign of collective expulsions, it is also a state-sponsored campaign of racial terror. Dominican authorities appear to be primarily relying on racial profiling to carry out this campaign, as Black Dominicans, Dominicans of Haitian descent, and Haitians with legal immigration statuses have consistently been swept up in raids and detained. Human rights violations are rampant. Network members have documented cases of Dominicans of Haitian descent being deported to Haiti, and there are also reports of Black people who are neither Haitian nor Dominican being expelled to Haiti since the start of this campaign. Our, mem our member organizations have received firsthand accounts of people who attest that at the hands of Dominican authorities, they were beaten, sexually assaulted, held without food or water for days in detention, and forced to pay bribes to be released. These are not isolated incidents, and these type of occurrences did not begin during this campaign, unfortunately, but with the massive uptick in numbers of people being deported, the frequency of these violations have soared. And this underlying context in this campaign is critical to understand, again, for the region, but I just want to note, um, prior to, to pivoting back to the region, this, the government announced that they far surpassed their goal of deporting 10,000 Haitians per week. The Ministry of Interior tweeted a few days ago that there had been 60,000 repatriations to Haiti in the span of a month, a number um, that includes 7,000 children and 2,000 pregnant women. And at the pace instructed by the Dominican government, that would be approximately 500,000 people to be deported to Haiti in one year. Um, the current situation in the DR is likely one of the clearest examples of the devolution and disregard for the human rights of Haitians and mobility, but the DR is not alone, as Melanie will speak further to what has been happening in Jamaica. And our hemispheric network is deeply concerned that other countries in the region may feel emboldened and further unrestrained to enact similar campaigns against Haitians if there is not a clear outcry and denunciation of these violations. We call on the Commission to send a clear message to all of the countries in the region that respect for the rights of Haitians in mobility and those of Haitian descent is non-negotiable. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for um, setting the context. And in this context of crisis in Haiti and the context of repression in countries such as the Dominican Republic, this has activated unprecedented flows of Haitians towards Jamaica as Haitians seek other routes towards safety, fleeing a devastating crisis in their country. And since July 2023 alone, 
we documented over 280 Haitian migrants and asylum seekers, including women, children, families, and persons with disabilities arriving in Jamaica. This figure includes eight relatively large groups who arrived through irregular channels, mostly in unseaworthy boats after tra traversing treacherous waters. It also includes 59 Haitian children deprived of parental care and adults with disabilities who enter Jamaica through regular channels on humanitarian grounds, accompanied by 14 Haitian caregivers. Yet despite the principle of non refoulement that, that Gabriel mentioned, and despite Jamaica's obligations under the Refugee Convention, most were collectively expelled without an individualized assessment of their protection needs. Uh, some remain in Jamaica, some have sought asylum and are waiting, awaiting the outcome of their claims. But the critical point is that there is now a growing population of Haitians, asylum seekers, families, children, and women in Jamaica who are in urgent need of protection, but exist below the radar, beyond international scrutiny, and in many cases, in dungeon-like dungeon cells in police station lockups. This includes 37 Haitian asylum seekers, men, women, and children, whose asylum claims were collectively rejected and who are at a campsite in St. Mary in a very nebulous immigration status that leaves, leaves them vulnerable to arbitrary detention and harassment by police. This includes over 20 Haitian asylum seekers, including women, deprived of liberty in inhumane conditions, mostly in very rudimentary police station lockups, in conditions that we believe breach the threshold of torture and ill treatment. There are six Haitian children who have been deprived of liberty in state facilities since May this year, without communication with their parents and relatives in Jamaica. Two of them are missing in the sense that their mother has no idea where they are for the past five months. And as I mentioned, we have over 50 Haitian adults and children with disabilities in need of specialized care who are being housed at a facility in Jamaica. This emerging situation that is new for Jamaica requires a comprehensive, urgent response. However, instead, Jamaica has adopted a zero tolerance policy that exposes these vulnerable Haitians to various forms of mi migration related abuse. Under this policy, undocumented Haitians, including Haitian migrant parents traveling with their children, are automatically criminally prosecuted, detained, and separated from their children without access to an asylum procedure. We have identified five main pillars of this zero tolerance policy that we believe are particularly concerning. The first is the designation of undocumented Haitians as ineligible for refugee status. According to Jamaica's Minister of National Security, Haitian nationals who enter Jamaica through irregular channels are not eligible for refugee status, nor are they entitled to due process because of quote unquote problems with Haiti. Rather, they are subject to immediate removal without the right to communicate with a lawyer, access the courts or access an asylum procedure. And this leads to the second pillar of the policy and as a corollary, is the practice of collective expulsions. Since July 2023 alone, we, we have documented over 170 Haitian migrants and asylum seekers who were collectively expelled without due process, without access to an attorney at law, without access to an individualized assessment of their protection needs. These collective expulsions were carried out by heavily armed police officers and soldiers within, sometimes within 24 to 36 hours of the Haitians arriving or being intercepted by law enforcement uh, authorities, making it impossible for them to access remedies. These collective expulsions are facilitated by incommunicado detention in which Haitians are prevented from speaking with attorneys at law. And in all of the cases of collective expulsions that we at Freedom Imaginaries documented, we attempted to provide legal assistance. However, the Haitians were prevented by police officers from communicating with our attorneys, or they were rapidly returned in front of our eyes before, uh, before we had an opportunity to speak with them. In the case of the Haitian caregivers who came to Jamaica regularly to help care for their, some of them, their siblings who they would have grown up in an orphanage in Haiti together with, uh, they were rounded up one day, one evening in June, uh, taken to an unknown, unknown location, which was withheld from me as their attorney at law and the Haitians themselves. Uh, their requests for asylum were ignored, and then they were put on a Coast Guard vessel and sent back to Haiti, where on their journey to their communities, they were extorted by gangs. They went back to a community in flames, and they witnessed killings, uh, violence around them, and they are now hiding in fear. But most recently, on October 23 of this year, Haitians detained in lockups across the island were rounded up and collectively expelled. This includes persons with pending refugee claims and significant family ties in Jamaica.
And this leads to the third pillar of Jamaica's policy, which is arbitrary detentions in deplorable conditions. Under Jamaica's Aliens Act, illegal entry is a criminal offense punishable by imprisonment or a fine. There is also a provision that migrants can be kept in, in custody pending deportation, even though there are no charges against them and no intention to bring them uh, to trial for criminal prosecution. But because Jamaica has not designated appropriate facilities for migrants, Haitian migrants and asylum seekers who are charged with illegal entry or who await deportation are detained in these rudimentary police station lockups that are really not designed for long-term accommodation, but which have been transformed into de facto reception and accommodating accommodation facilities for Haitian asylum seekers. Detention in these cases is not used as a last resort and it's not kept to a minimum length of time. Rather, detention is automatic prolonged, and the conditions are spectacularly inhumane. As of today, we are aware of over 20 Haitians who are still detained, most of them for over five months awaiting trial for illegal entry. And we have documented shocking forms of arbitrary and unlawful detention. Haitians detained in police station lockups report being confined to tiny, dark, dungeon-like cells with no proper ventilation, sometimes no windows, no proper sanitation or bedding. They sleep on the floor in filthy conditions. They never get to go outside. They do not have access to adequate nutrition or safe drinking water. The water, the water used for drinking and bathing causes stomach problems, diarrhea, skin rashes, which are so severe to the point of requiring medical attention. And this is exacerbated by the lack of access to timely medical care. And the testimonies are truly heartbreaking. A pregnant woman, a pregnant Haitian woman, reports losing her baby while detained last year. A pregnant Haitian woman detained at the Bridgeport Police Station lockup in December 2023 was denied access to medical attention despite complaining about stomach pains. In October 2023, two Haitian asylum-seeking women were detained in a condemned cell at the Santa Cruz Police Station lockup in St. Elizabeth. The lockup had been closed after being deemed uninhabitable, but the Haitian women were nonetheless kept in the cell block where they slept on the floor and bathed in public view. A Haitian woman who was detained at the Four Paths police station lockup in Clarendon for over three months describes a rat infested cell where rats brushed past her while she slept on the floor. She suffered excruciating pain from engorged breasts on account of being separated from her breastfeeding baby. There was no safe drinking water at the lockup and so she had to rely on visitors bringing water or not drink water at all. She suffered from high blood pressure but struggled to take prescribed medications because they had to be taken with a meal and meals at the lockup are insufficient and inadequ inadequate. Two Haitian men held in administrative detention without charge at the St. Anne's Bay police station lockup in March and April last year were brutally beaten and burned with fire by fellow inmates without protection and without access to medical treatment. Haitians at the Manchineal police station lockup and the Ca Castle police station lockup in Portland since May 2024 report on sanitary conditions, with some of them having to defecate in plastic bags in their cells. We have found a number of Haitians languishing in police station lockups, as I said, without charge pending deportation, which we believe is a particularly serious form of arbitrary detention that leads to impermissible risks of, of torture and ill treatment. And we had mentioned another pattern of incommunicado detention in which Haitians are explicitly prevented from speaking with attorneys at law, and we believe this is to facil facilitate their rapid expulsion without the intervention of the courts. And we have noted prolonged detention without charge. But perhaps the situation that is most troubling and that shocks the conscience is the issue of family separations because the sanctity of family unity in Jamaican society under international law and under the, constitutional, under the constitution is, is, is non-controversial. Over the past year, we observed several cases of parent-child separation. This includes Haitians living in Jamaica undisturbed for years with their Jamaican Haitian families who are ripped away from their children and partners, thrown in dungeon-like cells and held in incommunicado detention for a period of time. As I mentioned, there are currently six children in children's homes, Haitian asylum-seeking children, including two unaccompanied minors. And these children have been separated from their parents for over five months. They have not visited or communicated with their parents and relatives outside of court for over five months. And the parent-child separation is having such a devastating impact that one has resorted to self-harm. This is compounded by allegations that of abuse at these state facilities, which have gone un un unresponded to. 
Uh, the situation of Mary, uh, not her real name, is particularly, particularly disturbing. Mary has been separated from her two children for over five months, and she does not know the location of her children. Mary fled violence in Haiti and arrived in Jamaica with her family in May. Soon after her arrival, she was arrested for illegal entry. Her children were taken away and put in state facilities at unknown locations. And when she recently this week went to the family court out of desperation to search for her children, she was arrested once, she was detained once again, uh, placed in a police station lockup, and now she faces imminent deportation despite her pending asylum claim. This context of abuse affecting Haitian asylum seekers in Jamaica is facilitated by a structural context in which Jamaica does not have refugee laws, uh, Jamaica does not have an effective asylum procedure for the assessment, individualized assessment of protection needs, and Jamaica does not have a designated facility for migrants and asylum seekers uh, while their asylum claims are pending. There are also administrative and other obstacles such as the language barrier, which makes it difficult and almost impossible for Haitians to seek remedies. And so I see I have one minute left, and so I would like to conclude with some practical, urgent uh, recommendations for both Jamaica, the Commission, and the Car Caribbean community. It is well established and proven that draconian approach approaches to mobility simply don't work. They just push per mig vulnerable migrants to uh, dangerous routes that put their lives at risk. And so given the complexity of the issue and the devastating implications for human rights, we call upon the international community, Jamaica, and the Caribbean community to adopt precautionary measures to safeguard the rights of Haitians in mobility in Jamaica and the region. We are calling for an independent investigation and an international investigative mission into the human rights impacts of Jamaica's treatment of Haitian migrants and asylum seekers. We are calling for Jamaica to work with CARICOM the international community and multi-stakeholder groups to establish a rights-based regional framework for the protection of Haitians in mobility. This must include a, a regional interagency coordinating platform to implement humanitarian protection and socioeconomic integration activities to assist the, the situation of Haitians in mobility. And we're calling on CARICOM to establish a common asylum procedure and policies at the regional level to ensure protection of Haitians in mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, representatives of uh, Freedom Imaginaries, for your contribution. And now I turn over to the state, to the Deputy Chief of Mission, Ms. Delita McCallum, for your uh, intervention. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Madam President, Commissioner Roberta Clark, Commissioner Arif Bolkan, Commissioner Andrea Pochak, and Executive Secretary Brennan, all, all protocols observed. Good morning, civil society. Good morning. At this, at this 191st session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights hearing concerning the human rights situation of Haitians in mobility in Jamaica, I take this opportunity to read this statement on behalf of the government of Jamaica. The government of Jamaica acknowledges the request for a thematic hearing on the human rights situation of Haitians in mobility within Jamaica, submitted for the ICHR's 191st period of sessions. As a state party to the American Convention on Human Rights and other international human rights instruments, Jamaica reaffirms its dedication to protection and promotion of human rights, not only for its own citizens, but for all individuals within its borders. This commitment is underscored by Jamaica's robust legal framework, which includes constitutional human rights guarantees, our participation in the ICHR hearing today, and our long-standing engagement with other mechanisms of the Organization of American States. The recent surge in arrivals of Haitian nationals, most if not all of whom have entered Jamaica through irregular and illegal channels, presents significant operational and, just, and logistical challenges for our country. 
Jamaica as a small island developing state faces limited financial and human resources as well as capacity constraints and it is important that this context be properly considered when discussing Jamaica's ability to provide support to our Asian neighbors in these difficult times. Amidst these constraints, Jamaica's response is and continues to be firmly committed to protecting human rights as we navigate the complexities of this situation. We also note that the state has been given limited timelines to respond to serious allegations concerning the conduct of the state and its officials. We urge the Commission to adopt a fair and balanced approach to all matters presented for its consideration. In response to issues raised in the request for this hearing, Jamaica would like to clarify its actions and its immigration procedures while outlining the measures the state is taking to protect vulnerable persons and ensure access to justice for all. The allegations of collective expulsion. In the hearing request, it is alleged that Jamaica operates a de facto tolerance policy against Haitian migrants, leading to mistreatment, including arbitrary detention and collective expulsions. Jamaica categorically rejects this allegation and states that it has no policy in place that targets Haitians or any other group for mistreatment. Instead, Jamaica's approach to managing the increasing flow of illegal migrants is based on a full commitment to providing the necessary humanitarian support subject only to capacity constraints, including the lack of financial resources and the duty to protect national security interests. Jamaica faces a unique challenge as a transit country for Haitian nationals. Intelligence reports indicate that organized crime networks frequently facilitate illegal entry of migrants, often through dangerous channels. These criminal organizations operating with transnational links transport migrants to undisclosed locations and employ tactics such as sinking vessels upon arrival in Jamaica to avoid detection. Tactics observed in incidents involving Haitian migrant groups in November 2023 and May 2024. The security risks associated with these organized smuggling operations are amplified by evidence of the legal entry of firearms, contraband, and human trafficking. Intelligence reports indicate that approximately 200 firearms are trafficked from Haiti to Jamaica each month fueling to gun violence, notably the guns for drugs trade between Haiti and Jamaica is of significant concern to the government of Jamaica and must be taken into account as it addresses illegal migration and the substantial threat it poses to public safety. The state urges the commission to recognize the broader context within which Jamaica operates, including the significant security risks posed by these organized networks. While Jamaica remains committed to upholding the rights of all within its borders, the state must rigorously enforce immigration laws and exercise its sovereign right to protect its citizens and their fundamental rights, including the right to life from the very real dangers posed by illegal migration. Amidst this, against this backdrop, the state emphasizes the clear distinction in both international law and Jamaica's legal framework between asylum seekers and illegal immigrants. In many cases, Haitian nationals who enter Jamaica irregularly often enter primarily for economic migration or as a transit point to other destinations. Jamaica's right as a sovereign state to secure its borders and manage illegal migration is well-founded in international law and consistent with the United Nations Global Pact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, the Compact. Paragraph 15 of the Compact, in particular, reaffirms that states have the sovereign right to determine their migration policies. 
distinguishing between regular and irregular migration statuses, include um, considering national realities and requirements for entry. Jamaica's Aliens Act served as a primary legal framework for addressing for assessing foreign nationals entering the country. Section 5 of the Act empowers immigration officers to grant or deny permission to land based on the conditions outlined in Section 6. The Act mandates that foreign nationals present themselves to immigration officers upon entry for assessment and authorizes the return of foreign nationals who are denied permission to land. Contrary to allegations of collective expulsion, in the hearing request, Jamaica conducts individualized assessments for all migrants. As part of Jamaica's standard operating procedure and in line with the Aliens Act, all migrants are, inter are interviewed by immigration officials upon arrival to assess their nationality purpose of travel and country of origin in order to determine whether they will be landed. For Haitian nationals who have entered through irregular channels, food and medical attention are provided to ensure their health needs are met. Where language barriers arise, as in the case of Haitian nationals, interpreters are provided to facilitate effective communication and information collected and is used to inform decisions on granting leave to land in accordance with Jamaica's policy and legislative framework. Further, pursuant to paragraph 10A of Jamaica's refugee policy, the refugee policy and established procedures, Jamaican immigration officers are required to determine, often with assistance of interpreters, whether an individual wishes to apply for refugee status. Notably, paragraph 10A9 of the refugee policy states that where it is ascertained that the person is not applying for refugee status, the person shall be treated as an illegal immigrant in accordance with relevant immigration legislation. Several Haitian nationals who enter Jamaica through irregular channels are returned to Haiti in accordance with the Aliens Act following a thorough determination that they do not meet the legal requirements of the act and have not requested asylum under the refugee policy. In response to the allegation of collective denial of asylum applications in the hearing request, the state reiterates that its process for asylum applications involves a thorough multi-stage review to ensure fair treatment the eligibility criteria outlined in the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol are applied to each applicant and an assessment made to determine if they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their country of nationality on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. As previously noted, where it is established that an individual is not seeking asylum, they are processed as an illegal immigrant under the Aliens Act. Concerning measures to address vulnerable groups, including children and families. Jamaica is particularly attentive to the needs of vulnerable groups, especially children and families. In compliance with international human rights and standards, such as the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, in cases where children of Asian migrants are involved, the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA, assesses each case to determine appropriate placement, ensuring that children are not housed in adult detention facilities. In making these placements, the CPFSA considers age, gender, and other factors relevant to the child's best interest. All placements are subject to judicial review, which adds another layer of protection, consistent with Jamaica's Child Care and Protection Act and international child protection standards. Jamaica emphasizes that all child migrants receive equitable treatment without punitive measures applied to their status. The state assures the commission that all the concerns raised regarding Haitian children in state facilities have been referred to Child Protection and Family Services Agency and the Office of the Children's Advocate. 
The Child Care Protection Act of 2004 enshrines protection against abuse and ensures welfare of the children in state care. The CPFSA investigated several of the allegations raised in the request concerning Asian children, including conduct, conducting interviews with them using interpreters to ensure clear and accurate communication. Following these investigations, staff implemented an effective system to address concerns. Furthermore, the CPFSA's report indicates that the children involved are now adjusting well to the facility environment. The CPFSA and the OCA, in accordance with their mandates, will continue to closely monitor and, and address this situation. Earlier this year, the state also made the necessary arrangements for the secure transfer of 59 Haitian orphans living with disabilities from Haiti to Jamaica. They are currently housed in facilities managed by mustard seed communities. These efforts demonstrate the state's commitment to ensuring the protection of vulnerable groups. Concerning access to legal remedies and procedural safeguards for Haitian migrants, the state notes and emphatically denies the concerning allegations in the hearing request regarding absence of legal remedies, denial of due process rights, and limited access to counsel for Haitian nationals in Jamaica. The state affirms that legal representation is available to all individuals in custody under Jamaican law. The state is aware of logistical challenges that may arise in facilitating council visit to holding facilities and remains committed to addressing them to the best of its ability within the constraints of available resources and security requirements. The state reaffirms that access to counsel is provided to persons in custody, though it may require coordination based on facility capacity and security protocols. Jamaica's security authorities continue to make reasonable and appropriate accommodations, ensuring that the legal rights of those in custody are respected. Jamaica's judicial system provides effective legal remedies for all within its jurisdiction, including Haitian nationals. Several Haitian nationals who have entered the country legally have initiated constitutional claims before the Supreme Court seeking various declarations concerning inter alia the treatment of Haitian migrants. Notably, the Supreme Court has already issued favorable rulings for Haitian nationals, demonstrating the independence and impartiality of Jamaica's courts, which are well equipped to address these matters in the interest of justice. The state underscores that anyone within its physical jurisdiction, irrespective of nationality, immigration or refugee status may apply to the Supreme Court of Jamaica for constitutional and fundamental rights protection. The state also acknowledges that language support remains a challenge, particularly for Haitian Creole speakers, and invites assistance from international partners, including the Commission, to improve access to interpreters and, in and enhance communication. Challenges in providing sustainable shelter and detention facilities. The state notes the concerns raised in the hearing request regarding detention conditions. Jamaica faces significant challenges in sub sub sustainable accommodating Haitian nationals in circumstances where there has been a recent influx of illegal migrants. The state's current detention and shelter facilities have reached capacity but the state continues to provide dedicated support, including shelter, food, and security. Recently, the Ministry of National Security successfully negotiated temporary use of a facility operated by the Ministry of Labor and Social Security, known as Camp Cape Clare in the parish of St. Mary. This facility currently approx shelters approximately 43 Asian nationals, including a group of 37 asylum seekers. Despite the strain on resources, Jamaica continues to treat Asian migrants humanely with the same dignity afforded to all individuals. The state recognizes areas needing improvement and calls on the Commission and other international partners to assist. In line with its commitment to promoting human rights, Jamaica launched Project ROC Rebuild Overall and Construct to improve detention facility conditions. 
This initiative, led by the Ministry of National Security in collaboration with the National Housing Trust and the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, aims to provide more humane and adequate accommodation for persons in custody concerning regional cooperation and commitment to international obligations. As a CARICOM member, Jamaica supports a collaborative regional approach to migration issues, particularly Haitian mobility. As part of Jamaica's commitment to Haitian stability, the government also deployed security forces to support a multinational security support mission to Haiti pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution 2699 adopted on October 2, 2023 to re-establish security in Haiti. This mission is essential to Haiti's security and countering the increasing, increasingly violent actions taken by armed groups and criminal networks and by extension to the region's stability. Jamaica invites the Commission to consider these ongoing efforts, as well as the state efforts in improving the welfare of all Haitian migrants in Jamaica. While Jamaica is committed to enhancing protections, we emphasize that meaningful support, including funding and technical assistance, is critical to implementing the ambitious recommendations in the hearing request. Jamaica urges the Commission to consider these constraints and to bring to the attention of other states through its annual report to the OS General Assembly, the complexity of the situation and the urgent need for international assistance. In closing, Jamaica remains open to further dialogue with international partners to build its capacity for managing irregular migration flows effectively. We underscore that a coordinated multi-state approach is essential as Jamaica cannot address this complex challenge on its own. We invite the Commission to take into account the unique challenges faced by small island developing states like Jamaica and to recognize the, re the state's ongoing efforts to assist the Haitian government in restoring law, order and stability. Jamaica will provide a further response to issues raised in this hearing in writing within a reasonable time frame. The state takes this opportunity to renew to the Commission the assurances of its highest consideration and providing this opportunity to clarify its actions, policies, and commitments to human rights, particularly concerning Haitian nationals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief of Mission. And now we have the chance for the Commission to ask questions or make comments. And I want to start with the country rapporteur, Commissioner Bulkan. Thank you very much, Madam President. Before you start, Commissioner Bulkan, can we set the clock, please? Please proceed. Thank you, Madam President. 12 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. And I think we have 20. I think the clock is, I think the clock is wrong. I'm sorry, uh, Commission Bulkan, but I want us to get it right. Uh, the Commission, thank you. Okay, please proceed. Thank, thank you, Madam President, for the third time. And, <laughs> and thank you most especially to, um, to the parties here. Uh, members of Freedom Imaginary and Imaginaries and your team, as well as to the Honorable Representative of the Illustrious State of Jamaica, um, and as well to all of those who might be following online. I, I wanted to start off by saying um, how impressed I am at the level and the quality of the information presented on both sides of this hearing. And I, I want to say that I wanted to start off with that um, because um, the issue of of asylum asylum seeking and refugee as we've all acknowledged and must acknowledge is a very complex and a nuanced position um and so let me let me say at the outset that the role of the commission here is not to penalize is not to condemn um this is not a trial and and i hope that this hearing does exactly what I, I think that the civil society is intended to do, which is to raise visibility and awareness of the issue and perhaps to lead to constructive um, engagement and solutions. But to come back to the issue of refugee, um, the problem of, of refugees and asylum seekers, I think both, both parties here have outlined so well 
um, the challenges that it poses in today's society. And in fact, this is not a regional problem. This is an international problem. The, 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 the scale of refugees because of wars and climate change and, and environmental factors and everything across the globe has been just, you know, exponentially increasing. So it's something that the entire world has to gra grapple with. But on the one hand, there are um, humanitarian challenges and, and the problem with um, the treatment of, of, of refugee seekers um, and the, the, the problem of the conditions under which they probably exist many, many, of, many of the times. And on the other hand, what states face, especially small states, in managing um, an influx of people um, given limited financial and human resources, as you've pointed out um, on, the, on behalf of the state. Um, so my comments are not meant, uh, are meant, I, I, and I preface this to say that I understand the complexity of the issue, and my comments are just perhaps um, meant, meant to be sort of a starting point as to the role of the commission uh, and a way forward in, in this very difficult um, and sensitive issue. Um, as Freedom Imaginaries has pointed out, there are no laws domestically in, in Jamaica um, implementing the convention, but as the state has noted, you are a signatory, Jamaica is a signatory to the American Convention on Human Rights, and more particularly the 1951 Refugee Convention, the 67 Protocol. Um, and so there is already an international framework in Jamaica and conventional obligations in, in regard to the treatment of refugees. And so I think that that's an, a really important starting point. Now, um, wh while I note the challenges faced by Jamaica, and you've pointed them out so well um, in terms of the financial and human constraints, the influx of, 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 of Haitians or, it, since the, the conditions in that country have deteriorated, um, and as well the security concerns. Um, I wanted to note in particular that um, some of the guiding principles of refugee protection on the international law and highlight some of them, um, just as a framework for us to think about going forward. Um, and, and noting as well that Jama while Jamaica has some reservations to the convention, none really touch upon some of these principles. And, and I wanna highlight for instance, the principle of non-discrimination. And that's particularly because, as you've mentioned, the stigma that has surrounded Haitians across the region, um, the principle of non-discrimination, that nobody, no, no, no group of people or class of people should be discriminated because, because they are black or because they belong to some kind of social status or social group. Now, that's an important principle in human rights law, but it's also reinforced under the 51 Convention. Um, more particularly, Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, non-penalization. And, and, and this is so critical. The international community has said, um, has agreed that no penalties are going to be imposed on refugee seekers because of the way that they enter territories. Um, if they breach laws, I think that's something that we have to be um, to be mindful of, because often refugees have to come in by all sorts of irregular routes because of the way in which, um, in their own home countries, the way in which they are constrained. And we've already heard about the limited avenues for leaving, so that's something we have to bear in mind. Article 31, and then as well, most one of the most important principles of refugee law, um, non refoulement um, the, the fact that, that states can't return or expel um, refugee seekers um, because uh, it, where they face the danger, dangers of, of retaliation or threats to their life. These are some guiding principles for us. And so while, while I um, acknowledge that the state of Jamaica does have legitimate security concerns, does have legitimate financial and human concerns. Um, at the same time, we've heard some very difficult testimonies from civil society, difficult testimonies of the conditions under which Haitians have been operating, let's face it, for more than 200 years, um, but ramped up in recent times. Um, we, we've heard of 
and, and this is not to prejudge anything, but we've heard of testimonies of the way that uh, conditions that they, they, they face, perhaps this is across um, territories in which they might seek refuge in the way that they're detained, the conditions of detention, um, the family separ separation. These are all problems, not to say that Jamaica is culpable or Jamaica is guilty, but they, they often come um, in any situation in which there is a surge of, of, of people seeking um, refugee status. So I do think um, a starting point from this, from this hearing um, are the recommendations that have been made um, so constructively by civil society, which is, uh, if I, just to highlight some of them, uh, an investigation into some of these concerns that have been raised, um, not to dismiss them out of hand, but to, to really meaningfully and independently investigate, are there situations in which um, Haitian refugees are being kept under deplorable or inhumane conditions in which there, there might be um, the threat of expulsion without following some of these guidelines in, in, in international um, refugee law. Um, but as well, um, the, the need for an integrated response that Jamaica is not, an, it's, it's not um, literally it is an island, but it's not an island in this figuratively, that there are many countries in the region, CARICOM, um, in, across CARICOM, there is free movement, but not, not of course, by, by Haiti's election, doesn't extend to Haiti. But the point is, um, this problem is not that of Jamaica alone, and we must consider, as the, as the petitioners have said, the, uh, the need for a integrated response. And underlying all of this is that humanitarian concerns must be taken seriously and addressed because at the end, end of the day, the most vulnerable must be treated um, with dignity uh, and, and with care. And so I, I want to end, I, I forgive me, uh, Madam President, for taking so long, but I, I want to, to end by simply saying that I do recognize the problems on both sides. I do, um, I do endorse the, the, the statement that Jamaica has a robust, independent judicial system uh, and as well a strong constitution, cons constitutional framework in terms of human rights. And so there has been a lot that has been positively acknowledged on the side of the state. And I think that that um, is a wonderful starting point for us to go forward, to go forward in terms of dialogue, to take the um, concerns of civil society seriously and to investigate independently as, as they've asked for, um, but as well to recognize that Jamaica is not alone in this and that they need a coordinated CARICOM response, perhaps, um, which would which would include help f for the financial costs of some of this. And in all of this, ultimately, um, the Commission um, has a role to play in terms of facilitating technical expertise and advice. Um, I thank you very much to Freedom Imaginary for so raising the profile of this problem and for the state for its very constructive response. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, um, Country Rapporteur Bulkan. And I turn over to Commissioner Bulchak, who is the Rapporteur, as I remind you, of uh, Rights of People and Human Mobility. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. I will speak in Spanish, sorry, <laughs> because I, we have mm, less time. Eh, muchas gracias por la por la audiencia, eh, me sumo a, a las palabras del relator para Jamaica. Eh, fue una audiencia muy productiva desde el punto de vista de la información recibida y, de, y del diálogo co, eh, constructivo y respetuoso que se tuvo aquí gracias a, a la delegación de las organizaciones y del ilustre Estado de, de Jamaica. La situación que trae esta audiencia eh, refleja una situación general en, en la región. Estamos hablando de personas haitianas en movilidad, eh, pero estamos hablando de una situación regional que no solamente abarca a personas haitianas, sino también a personas venezolanas, a personas nicaragüenses, colombianas, ecuatorianas. Eh, estamos hablando de la situación de las personas haitianas en Jamaica, pero no solo en Jamaica, ¿no? Hablaron también de República Dominicana. Es una situación regional 
eh, que desde la Relatoría de Movilidad Humana estamos advirtiendo con mucha preocupación, creciente preocupación. En este periodo de audiencias hemos tenido ya tres, cuatro audiencias específicamente sobre la situación de la movilidad humana en la región y los desafíos enormes que tienen los países para enfrentar esto, esta situación, eh, de manera que quiero poner esta audiencia en un contexto regional más, más amplio. Y por supuesto, la Comisión Interamericana es consciente de las limitaciones que tienen los estados a título individual, sobre todo estados insulares, eh, pequeños, en desarrollo, eh, para hacer frente eh, por sí mismos solos a estos enormes desafíos. Esto requiere eh, soluciones globales, lo han dicho la parte peticionaria, eh, lo ha dicho también el Estado. Eh, eh, la Comisión Interamericana eh, nos pide el Estado que tenga un enfoque justo y e equilibrado eh, y eh, la, la sociedad civil también reclama involucrar activamente a la comunidad internacional y a la comunidad cari caribeña en, en este tipo de respuestas. Y entonces mi intervención va hacia ustedes y a preguntarles cuál es el rol que creen que la Comisión Interamericana puede desempeñar para poder eh, ayudar a superar esta, esta situación. Por supuesto, nosotros como organización de organismo de protección de derechos humanos no podemos quedarnos inmóviles frente a situaciones específicas que se están denunciando, privaciones de la libertad, restricciones al derecho al asilo, situación de niños no acompañados, una situación humanitaria que requiere situaciones urgentes, pero también tenemos una responsabilidad como organismo regional para poder proponer a los estados, a la comunidad internacional, soluciones globales. Eh, y entonces la pregunta hacia ustedes es, ¿qué creen que la Comisión Interamericana puede hacer para eh, seguir contribuyendo? Yo creo que la Comisión tiene un enfoque regional en esto y no tiene un enfoque eh, de asignación de responsabilidades a, a los estados, pero ¿qué más podemos hacer eh, en este sentido? Y luego una pregunta específica al, al Estado y una pregunta específica a la sociedad civil. El, el Estado hablaba de, de que, bueno, que había redes ilegales, eh, que había tráfico de, de personas, había organizaciones delictivas que operan en esta situación y, y a nosotros nos serviría mucho desde la Comisión Interamericana poder conocer el estado de esas investigaciones penales. Estamos tratando de, de avanzar en, esta, eh, en, en, en esfuerzos para identificar situaciones de trata eh, y entonces nos ayudaría mucho conocer eh, el avance de las investigaciones que se han dado en, en Jamaica sobre esta cuestión. Y, y, a la, y a la sociedad civil, pero también al Estado, preguntarle si hay instancias de participación ciudadana, eh, hay, si hay instancias de articulación, de diálogo, para que este tipo de diálogos tan productivos, tan enriquecedores, tan constructivos, se puedan dar eh, también en el país. Esas son mis preguntas. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much, and uh, just for me to... Tanya, did you want to say anything? I, I, I can watch at the end, so please. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I am uh, going to maybe approach this as through my role as the rapporteur for Haiti. Um, and just to remind what we all know, but I think it, we always have to tell or remind ourselves what is that situation in Haiti now? Um, food insecurity, desperate food insecurity, children out of school, uh, people who can't ha access any uh, adequate health care, massacres, violence, including massacres, widespread sexual abuse against women and girls, uh, lack of safe transportation. Uh, we understand organized, uh, organized gangs are, are seizing property, seizing agricultural land, uh, seizing productive assets. So there's a whole disruption also of livelihood of Haitians. And in all of that, the, what what looks like almost a complete breakdown of the state apparatus. No health systems, police are leaving. I think the last statistic we saw, uh, over a thousand police officers fled themselves, fled Haiti, themselves also the the target of insecurity. Courts not working. So we, we know all of that, but that I think we say that because we have to frame how Haitians are considering what they must do next, what must they do for themselves, what must they do next. 
Um, there's no passport office, I suppose, to go and apply for a passport. I mean, there must be one, but it might be quite difficult to get to it and then for it to be functioning. So what do they do? You have to feed your children. You have to just live. Desperation hits you. You do what you can. And many will get on boats or leave in any way they can to try to get to safe harbor. This is just a humanitarian crisis. Um, and I think we start there, understanding the humanitarian crisis. And it's also not a crisis for any one country to have to manage. So when Haitians leave and they go to other countries, there are issues that have to be dealt with. And I think the representative of the state has outlined very well the concerns of Jamaica, the concerns for um, indirect consequences for insecurity, um, also the question of whether or not the state has the capacity. Can the state not have a response which may contain the demands on it now and in the future? These are legitimate concerns, but we're still left with a human being in front of you. And I think this is very much an issue that does require a regional response. And when we say regional response, not just within the Caribbean, but a regional response of the Americas in the Caribbean, because this problem will not go anywhere until the the, the, the underlying governance and political problems are solved. We had a, a, a session yesterday in relation to Venezuelan um, refugees. Seven, nearly eight, eight, million, eight million Venezuelans have left Venezuela. Um, how do you solve that when the country remains in political and social, social economic turmoil, similarly in Haiti? So we have to be thinking of addressing the consequences of irregular movement, but we also, of course, have to be thinking about the causes of that, and that's a political solution that is required. And here I also want to recognize that Jamaica has played a, quite a part in, in, in trying to find that, to contribute to that political solution, um, along with other member states in the configuration of the Transitional Presidential Council. But look at the news over the last week in relation to that Transitional Presidential Council. So this is an ongoing and deepening political crisis. I'm saying everything that we know already, so it may sound a bit trite, but just to maybe re-emphasize two things. One, the complexity, but also the humanity of the situation. Um, something that we all have to grapple with and think about. How do we manage this um, complex and complicated reality? I want to ask the, the, the representative of the state of Jamaica, because I'm really troubled by the question of children's separation, family separation. And um, I, I, you've given a number of, 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 of examples of how the state is trying to manage detention centers, detention conditions, um, care of children in facilities. It seems to me that the question of, of child separation might be one that could be solved. It doesn't seem to be that many children, uh, maybe Freedom Imaginaries, you can remind us how many children are separated from their families in Jamaica. Could that be, could that be one area that, that can, be, can be resolved, that children should be with parents, children should be in familial settings if their families are in, in, in Jamaica? Is, that, is there a possibility of thinking about a solution quite soon to the question of separation of children from their families and from their parents? What, is, what could be the way forward um, on that? And in, in relation to the other questions asked by my, commis my fellow commissioners, I won't repeat those because I also share those concerns. So with that, Tanya, you have something to say. Yes, I have uh, 10 seconds just to thank everyone uh, for being here. And I'm, I mean, I, we heard a huge gap of information between what we heard from civil society and we, we heard from the state. And that is a thing that usually happens in such crisis that we are living here. Uh, the commission has been releasing some resolutions regarding solidarity with Haiti, especially the, the migration. Um, in 2022, we released a, a, a resolution on that matter. And we released in 2023 a report on Haiti and and, and it, it, it was very specific regarding um, migration. But this is a dialogue. This is the Inter-American Dialogue too. Hearings are so helpful to raise awareness, but also to talk in the best terms with civil society and state members, member states. So I wonder if there is a possibility that the Jamaican government could invite the commission to visit the facilities. 
not to say how good or how bad are they, but also to open the door to technical cooperation and to um, talk about how other countries should also get into the conversation. Because when we talk with the Dominican Republic about the migration, we face similar situations about the massiveness of, of migration. When we talk regard, uh, to, um, to other small countries in the Caribbean, we face the challenges and we recognize the challenges of small administrations and, small, and small countries receiving massive number of people. But probably it might be helpful or how the commission can be helpful. And I believe that uh, if we could go and visit the facility, we could open the door to a more open and frank conversation with technical cooperation. So just to let to drop the idea here and to work on the idea if, if that is suitable for the Jamaican um, country. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And now we turn back to the civil society, Freedom Imaginaries. I believe you have 12 minutes for a response. And also do recall that you can send in your responses by documents as well. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, um, State Representative and Commissioners. Um, I believe that this has been a, a very productive space for dialogue, and I'm encouraged by the comments by the State Representative about the need for a regional coordinated approach. And I believe that this is perhaps a, a, a point of consensus upon which we can rapidly develop um, shared ideas and understandings about how to move forward. Um, and to respond directly to the question about uh, the role of the commission, uh, perhaps as we develop this regional framework and coordinated response, I wonder if there's an opportunity for capacity building because I hear what the state is saying in terms of its challenges. And what I interpret that as from my perspective is a challenge in terms of dealing with mixed migratory flows in which you have the state has concern, security concerns and civil society has concerns about human rights issues for vulnerable populations. And so the question is how to screen these mixed migratory flows to ensure that persons with legitimate asylum claims and persons in situations of vulnerability, such as women, uh, children, unaccompanied minors, asylum seekers, and victims of human trafficking aren't collectively uh, treated in a way that returns them to a place where they face persecution or in a context in which they're denied the urgent protection that they need. And so in this context, uh, in responding to these mixed migratory flows and security concerns, our position is that families should never be separated. Children should never spend a day in, in police station lockups and criminalization and detention should not be automatic, but rather it should be a measure of last resort. And so uh, I would, I would ask if there could be an opportunity for training of frontline um, persons, immigration officers, the persons doing the screening and the persons executing um, how Jamaica responds to these flows, um, train them in those individualized screenings and, and assessments. Uh, another another point of, of uh, intervention is the, the site visit to look at what is happening on the ground. Because one of the things that occurred to us, um, for example, is that perhaps policymakers in Kingston may not be aware of what is happening in lockups in remote facilities because these facilities really are remote. Uh, for me to get there, I have to travel over four hours on, on very bad roads. Um, these are not places I would have ever visited outside of this work. And so I wonder how much of the problem is that uh, the conditions in these facilities or the day-to-day -day operations aren't being um, monitored. And so I wonder if there's an, an opportunity for oversight, both at the international level through an international in, you know, mission, but also through, through domestic authorities as well. Uh, I note the, the comments about the limited capacity of Jamaica uh, in term, and the capacity constraints in terms of dealing with the influx um, of, of flows of Haitian migrants and asylum seekers to Jamaica. And I think this underscores the need for this regional framework um, of shared responsibility and international solidarity so that there is a response that is you know, e equitable and there's burden sharing across countries. And on the question of economic migrants, uh, 
my understanding of the situation from dealing with uh, many Haitians who arrive, uh, my understanding is that they're not economic migrants, but rather persons fleeing persecution. Uh, I would like to invite Gabriel Apollon to speak about this question of economic migrants and the context in Haiti. Gabriel? Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank um, all of the commissioners and the state as well. Um, and I do want to revisit some of the conditions that um, the special rapporteur in Haiti highlighted that I think are incredibly important as we look at this, this narrative and this um, sadly, as as um, uh, Rapporteur Bokan had mentioned, this long history of of um, identifying Haitians as as economic migrants or identifying them as frankly not meriting the protections that other migrants in the region and historically have received, um, and that I think there's a number of of reasons behind that, but. Uh, Special Rapporteur Clark highlighted the massacres um, that have recently occurred. Um, we also have, you know, as I mentioned, just a myriad, um, myriad of, of rights violations. I will mention, you know, in 2023, Haiti had more civilian deaths than the Ukraine um, in eight months of 2023 than the entire year of the Ukraine. So I, I just highlight that to to show the severity of of the violations, the the murders, the things that people are fleeing, um, and and I think that's incredibly important because un unfortunately it is it is not only um, th this state but many states in the region that have have sought to continue to to put Haiti Haitians in this block of economic migrants when it does not fit the conditions on the ground when it does not fit the realities that are in Haiti currently. Um, I'm happy to to share more after you continue. Thank you, um, Gabriel. And those are our observations. I'm happy to respond to any further questions. Thank you. I, I did. Thank you very much, Representative Civil Society. Over to you, Deputy Chief. Thank you very much, um, Madam President, Roberta Clark. Just to say thanks again for this opportunity to have this very meaningful exchange this morning. I think all sides can agree that it was very, very fruitful and it certainly speaks to a positive way forward. Um, on the behalf of the Jamaican government, I just want to, to reassure that we have taken the concerns raised seriously. We have responded and any ad additional concerns that have been raised this morning um, will be responded to in writing as stated in my statement this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ramos. Thank you very much, uh, Representative, again, of civil society, also Deputy Chief of Mission, Ms. McCullum. 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 <laughs> I'm getting a little tight tongue this morning. I need some more coffee. Um, it's a it's an ongoing issue, and we no doubt we'll be talking about it more and more and more. But I think if we can, from the point of the Commission, support um, the the dialogue between the state and between civil society organizations, and maybe in a triangular way, also with Haitian uh, civil society organizations about how to manage uh, the, the the movement of people across borders looking for safety, security, livelihood, just for food. I think this is the role of the commission, and it's not just with Jamaica um, Executive Secretary. Mm -hmm. It's a number of countries around Haiti that are also experiencing the movement of Haitians, as I said, seeking safety and freedom and food. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone for your, I always end it this way because I feel it like this way, for your trust in the Commission. And in trusting the Commission, you are actually also supporting the Commission's mandate. And we hope that we can, well, not we hope, we will do our part to contribute to the promotion and protection of the rights of people um, in, in, move, in, in movement, um, human mobility. Thank you very much, and I now bring the hearing to a close. Well, this will go this way. Uh, <laughs>